Jesus City. My name is Jason, the pastor of Jesus City Church here in Montgomery, Alabama. And we want to welcome you to church wherever you're at. Maybe you're here local or maybe not. We love you. We're thankful for you. And we believe that God loves you. That's right. He loves you. And he he wants to do a great work in your life. Here at Jesus City, our desire is to build a church that looks like heaven. Uh, A church of every tongue, every people group, every nation. You know, we didn't come to the South to have a church that just looks one certain way, because we believe that one day when we get to heaven, we're gonna see people that look a lot different than us. And so why wait till heaven to have a church that looks like it? And so we, we are thankful that you're here, that you're joining us. And honestly, we want to hear your story. If you've been watching or been a part of Jesus City Church, would you let us know uh, that you've been a part of the ministry? You can contact us and you can send us emails and even let us know how this ministry has impacted you or helped you out in your relationship with the Lord. We're thankful because God has been doing a great work here in Montgomery. We launched the church officially a few weeks ago with a good friend of mine named Daryl Strawberry. And it was incredible. We had 260 people that came out and joined us in person. And now we're trucking away. Now we're meeting and now we're starting some small groups. And now we're we're getting some ministries established, some evangelism ministries. We've been so excited to wait, you know, up until this moment that we can say we've got a church. We've got a team. We've got people that are serving in different capacities. and, And God is doing a work here just in Alabama and truly it's all credit to him. And so we're praising God for what he's been doing. But I want to invite you, you know, if you live here in Alabama, would you come join us? Would you be a part of the ministry? We're meeting in person. It's 11 o'clock every Sunday, and we're here at 120 Dexter. This is on Dexter Avenue, the same street as the Capitol Building and Martin Luther King Jr.'s church. It's It's a great location. We know that God is working, but we don't just care about the massive numbers. We care about you. You know, I want to see God take a hold of your life. I want to see him ignite your faith and set you on fire where you are a light in a dark place where he's using you to reach people. Today, we're going to talk about the book of Philippians. We've been going through the book of Philippians. It's a new series called Joyful Living. These are the secrets to living a joyful life. And we're looking at a book written by a guy named Paul, and I know you're going to love it. And so we're in part two of chapter one today. Grab your Bible, and I hope you enjoy the message. Hang in there. I've got some important things at the very end that you need to hear. But God bless you, family. Welcome to Jesus City Church. The title of the message today is Under Construction. We're going to be picking back up in the book of Philippians, where we left off with last week, chapter one, verses three through 11. Now, some of the most beautiful and awe-inspiring creations have taken years, if not decades, to finish. Where there's been uh, 
a focus on sculpting and painting and building year upon year, decade upon decade, for it to be the masterpiece that we appreciate today. Like, let me ask you about some of these buildings, some of these creations. How long do you think it took for them to finish these things? One of them is the White House. The White House uh, was a project that started in 1792, George Washington. Of course, he wanted to make it the president's house. How long do you think it took for the White House to be finished? 13 years, okay, that's how long. That's a long time for a house to be built. You know, George Washington didn't even get a chance to live in it, okay, that's how long it took. Here's another one, Mount Rushmore. How long do you think it took for Mount Rushmore to be sculpted out of solid stone up on that mountaintop? I got to go there. I actually got to be on top of George Washington's head, which was pretty awesome. Um, I have a picture to prove it, uh, but I, I was up there. How long do you think it took for them to sculpt Mount Rushmore? 14 years. So when you go today and you stand at the foot of the mountain, you look up at it, I mean, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Like, wow, this thing's crazy. And they sculpted that thing with dynamite. Very, very impressive. Okay, here's another thing. You know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, we've heard about it. I'm, I've never visited myself, but did you know it took 199 years for the Leaning Tower of Pisa uh, to be finished? I mean, that's a long time. I mean, think about the, the length of time that took. And here's another one. How long do you think it took for the Great Wall of China to be completed? This thing is 4,100 miles long. That's a long distance. They say that over time, it was held with over a million armed guards. That's how many people were on this thing. But how long do you think it took? Was it 100 years? Was it 200 years? Was it 1,000 years? Wrong. It took 2,000 years to finish the Great Wall of China. You can see the Great Wall of China from space. It's like one of the only things that you can see, one of the only man-made things that you can see from space, which is pretty incredible. Now, here's my pro tip for you guys, all right? So you married men. You know, if you're kind of like me, if your wife has given you a project that's taken you a long time to finish and complete, uh, you know, maybe there's some things you haven't put the final touches on yet, like cleaning the garage, or maybe you have like a leaky toilet. Uh, there's a room, kind of like my house, that you haven't finished painting yet. Things that you've taken apart, you haven't put them back together again. You know, you can just remind your wife, you know, remind them just by like, look, I mean, it took 2,000 years for the Great Wall of China. You know, I mean, the statue of David that Michelangelo painted, I mean, it took him four years to paint that masterpiece. Uh, you know, I mean, God, God, give me a little time here. You know, <laughs> this doesn't quite work when she tells you to pick up your socks or she tells you to take out the trash. Uh, you can't be like, hey, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you can't, <laughs> you can't respond with that. Um, my wife, kind of funny, I mentioned that the other day. I said, hey, Rome wasn't built in a day. And she said, if it was left up to guys, Rome would have never been built. I was like, hey, easy, easy. But, you know, on a serious note, you know, if, if we were to show up, you know, let's just say to uh, the White House, like, you know, year seven when it was under construction and me and you were to show up, you know, in the early 1800s and we are walking amongst the construction site of the White House and we're looking at the pillars and we're looking at the rooms, but it's not finished yet. We would probably be talking be like, man, they've been working on this thing for seven years. Like, aren't, aren't they done yet? Like this thing's taking forever, okay, to finish. But then if one of like, say the project manager was to come over, you know, the architect would be like, hey, do you love what I've done here? And yeah, we'll probably be finishing up in about six or seven more years, but what? Why in the world is it taking so long? It would feel like, man, is this thing ever going to finish? Or if we go to the Great Wall of China, let's go back in time, and let's just say we go to year 1000. So they've been working on this wall for a thousand years. And we're asking them, how much farther are we going to go? You know, how much longer? And they go, oh, it's going to probably take us another thousand years to finish. <laughs> it would seem overwhelming. It would be a task that would be like, uh, like, okay, let's just give up now. I mean, what, what's going on? Like, this seems like it's never going to end. It's in an incomplete stage. Today, our main encouragement, really, that we're going to find from the text is this. And it's about our life. If you examine your life right now, if you take a screenshot, a snapshot of your life, 
currently, right where it's at, in your relationship with God, you know, your current state, where you're at, the progress you've made as a Christian, your emotional ups and downs, your struggles with sin, your, your level of giving in and fighting temptation, your level of holiness, you know, how far you are in sanctification. If we were to just take a screenshot of that right now, it would almost feel like it was incomplete. And you would look at your life and maybe be discouraged. Some of you would be encouraged, but maybe some of you would be discouraged. Like, man, look, how far have I got? I mean, I, I really haven't come that far in my struggles, in my temptations, but I can tell you this, this is what you would see. You would see a project, a good work that is still under construction. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Bible tells us this. It says that for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Listen, if God has gotten a hold of your life, then you're under his craftsmanship. You're under his chiseling hammer, under his refining hand. And he is at work in and on you. He's molding you and shaping you into the image of Jesus Christ. Listen, God was at work in your life when he got a hold of you, okay, when you came into a relationship with him, but he's also still at work in your life right now. And here's one of the main messages we're going to hear today. Every project that God starts, he finishes. And the good work that God undertakes, he completes it to perfection, including you. One of the main verses we're going to be looking at is in verse 6 of chapter 1 today in the book of Philippians, and it says this, being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God started the work, he's gonna finish the work in you. No matter how incomplete it may seem or feel, oh, he's, he's gonna finish what he's started. Now, last week we started the book of Philippians. We were in chapter one and we looked at the introduction. We found out that the book of Philippians is written by a guy named Paul, Paul the Apostle. Paul was writing this letter from an enslaved place in Rome. He was imprisoned. He was there against his will. He had chains on. He had an armed guard. He's shackled. And again, he didn't do anything to deserve this place, but it's from that location in this Roman cell that he writes this letter, really called the letter of joy. There's more words about joy and grace and rejoice and thankfulness, glory in this book than any of his other books. So it's interesting the dynamic that he's in prison, yet writing about real joy that you can find in Christ. And so he writes this letter to a group of dear friends who live in a city called Philippi. And he's intending this letter that we're looking at uh, as a thank you letter for all that they've continued to do for him and for his ministry. And so we're going to pick up and we're going to look at the book of Philippians right now. You should be there in chapter 1, starting in verse 3. This is what his thank you letter uh, starts off with and continues on about. I'll read it right now. I'm reading from the New King James translation. It says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for you all with joy. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, okay? I'm like, that doesn't sound like New King James. It's, it's New Living. All right. Verse 5. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Verse 6. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you. For you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in the defending and confirming of the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Verse 11, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, 
for this will bring much glory and praise to God. And let's pray. God, I ask that right now you would speak to our hearts as we've opened your word. I pray, God, you would, you would bring these truths to mind. And by your spirit, I pray, God, you would drive them into our hearts. And so, Lord, we love you. And we pray your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's easy to hear when we read verses 3 through 11. Really, what type of heart Paul had for these friends that were in this city called Philippi? He really loved these guys and these gals. Like he had a, a real tender heart for them. In verse 3, you notice that he says, I think about you and I give thanks to God for you. So like every time he thinks about these people, he, he thanks God for them. Like, do you have those type of people in your life where you just think about them and a smile comes to your face and you're just like, man, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for them. I have a few of those uh, people that I'm just, I'm so thankful to God uh, for them. And by the way, you should let those people know that you love them and that you thank, you're, you're thankful for them. Oftentimes we only put roses on people's graves, but if you send them ahead of time, I think they'll mean a little bit more. You know, send somebody some flowers, you know, send them a thank you note. Let them know that you, you think about them and you're thankful for them. So Paul's thankful for these people. Verse three. Verse four, he gets a, a lot of joy as he thinks about these people. Verse four, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. So he's not only thankful for these people, I mean, he's like elated in thinking about these people. When he's praying for these people, he gets joyful. He gets glad. He's like, man, God, thank you. Thank you for these people. I love them. So that's verse four. Verse five, he's got appreciation for these people. Verse five, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ Jesus. So now he's thanking them, real appreciation for what they've done. Um, and in verse seven and eight, you know, seven, he says, look, it's right for me to feel this way about you because you have a special place in my heart. That's verse seven. And verse eight, look what he says, God knows how much I love you. I long, I long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Paul genuinely loved these believers and he wanted them to know it. And so he writes them this really loving and kind, this big thank you letter, just to say, hey, I miss you guys. I love you guys. When I think about you, I smile. When I pray for you, man, I, I just laugh to myself thinking about what a blessing you've been to me. Now, when I read this, I got to ask myself, like, why did Paul feel this way about these people? Like, what was it that took place where Paul was moved to these affections and these feelings for, for these individuals? And I think it's three reasons, and we find it there in our text today. I think, number one, it's because he's thankful and he's rejoicing about their salvation, number one. Number two, it is their sanctification. And then thirdly, it's their support. So these are the three reasons that I find in the text why Paul kind of hints at why he's so thankful, why he's so in love, why he longs to be back with them, why he smiles when he thinks about them. It's because of, again, one, it's their salvation. Look at verse five. Verse five gives us a hint as to why Paul really loves these believers. Verse five, he says, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Verse six, and I'm certain that God who began the good work within you, kind of stopping there. Paul was thankful for these believers because they had come to Christ under his ministry, under his preaching. And so he thinks about their salvation. You know, Paul is thinking back to that very first encounter, that very first time that he went to Philippi and he visited them. And upon his visit, there were people that responded in the positive. They received the good news of the gospel and it just, it cheered him up. It was a real blessing. You remember if you went back and you read, remember I gave you a, a reading assignment. I said, everybody's supposed to go back and read Acts chapter 16. If you read Acts chapter 16, this is the very first time that Paul the apostle went on a missionary journey there to Philippi. And he was going there because he had a dream and he had this vision of this Macedonian man. And so he shows up to Philippi and God does a great work. There was a lady that he met that came to faith. And, you know, she completely repented and got right with the Lord. And her name was Lydia. And it was amazing, you know, to see what God was doing. But then also a little bit later, there was a jailer that came to Christ. You know, it was a crazy circumstance of what happened, but this jailer ended up repenting and his entire family came to Christ. 
Paul thinks back to those early days when he started out in that city. And he's thinking back to those early moments when these non-believers realized their need for Jesus and they turned from their sins to the living God and they really went all in with the gospel. And so Paul thinks back, he's like, man, you know what I love? I love the fact that from the very first day, you guys have been with me. Like back when God started that good work in you, Man, what, a, what a blessing that was. Like I can see Paul reflecting back to Acts chapter 16, you know, in, in his life, those early moments when, when him and Timothy and Silas were walking those streets for the very first time. You know, when I think about believers coming uh, into faith for the very first time, I can think back in my own life to when, when I've shared the gospel with somebody and I've seen them come to faith, and really what joy it brings. You see, Paul considered himself to be the spiritual father of these people. He's the spiritual father to some spiritual kids. And so he's excited because these were the first fruits. These were the first believers that really took place there in modern day Europe. You know, Lydia was pretty much like the first church house or house church, you know, in, in all of Europe. And so he's excited about that. He's thankful for that. And he's thinking back to that. Now, when God uses you to lead someone to Christ, it does something to you. Like it genuinely does. And let me ask you, like, have you ever led someone to Christ? Like when's the last time that you intentionally shared the gospel with someone? I was looking at some statistics and they say that 61% of Christians haven't shared their faith in the last six months. Another statistic, 89, sorry, 98% of Christians do not witness to non-believers weekly. And then here's another one, 95% of Christians have never led another person to Christ. When you have the opportunity to be used by God to preach the gospel, and then you see someone turn to Christ because of what you shared, it there's really nothing else like it. Like I put it at one of the top things that you can experience in life. You know, having an impact on somebody that has eternal consequences. They were on their way to hell, but because the Lord in you and through you preaching the gospel, now they've trusted in Christ and they're no longer on the way to hell. Now they're on their way to heaven. Like it's pretty surreal. It's pretty amazing uh, to think, man, God, you're using me. You used me for this. It's, it's a very surreal type of experience. And this is one of my passions, by the way, is helping you, helping people learn how to articulate the gospel, helping you get over some of those, um, I guess, fears of, man, I don't want to share the gospel. What if I get shut down? What if somebody makes fun of me? What if I say the wrong thing? It's been one of my passions throughout the years in helping people learn how to share the gospel. And actually, if you live here in Montgomery, I'm excited because I'm going to be starting up a monthly evangelism night where I'm going to be going out here at local Montgomery and I want you to come with me. I was doing this back in California every single Friday night and we would have a lot of people that would come out with us weekly and I want to get it started here. And so we're going to start up a, a monthly evangelism night and then we're going to, you know, turn it up a little bit more as time goes on. We'll do it twice a month and three times a month and I'm going to work up to doing it every single week where we are actively preaching the gospel. But I want to show you how to do it so that there's no excuse. I'm going to show you how to start a conversation, preach the gospel, lead someone to Christ because I want you to experience it. I want you to feel that feeling of being used by God. And actually, just even a few days ago, I was on a high school campus. It was called SUA. It was a high school campus. And I got invited to go there by a lady named Elva and her daughter named Sophia. And so I came and there's about 120 students there and it was amazing. I really believe that God is going to do a work here in Montgomery in the lives of the students at all of these public high schools. I think the public high schools are one of the largest unreached mission fields, you know, in America, to be honest with you. So I went this past week and when I was there, I got to stand up and preach the gospel. And you know what was amazing? You would think here in the South that everybody's a Christian. We're in the Bible belt. Everybody goes to church. No, I had, the, I had those kids raise their hands. Who goes to church? And it was like 90% of them did not go to church. It was only a few of them. So when it came time for me to preach the gospel and give opportunity for these young people to come to faith, 
32 people raise their hands and ask Christ to come into their life. Like, that was incredible. That was so awesome. You know, and you walk away from those things going, God, thank you. Thank you that I got to be a part of that. You know, it was all you, God. I mean, you saved them. You're the one that opened the eyes. You're the one that drew them to yourself. But Lord, thank you that I got to be a small part in that process. I got to be, play a small role, Lord, in you reaching in and snatching someone from the pit of hell. Thank you, God. And, and I want you to experience that. I want you to be a part of that. You should be preaching the gospel. You will rightly understand Paul's joy as he talks about, I think back to those first days and the good work that God has started in you. We can get a hint at the joy that Paul experienced about the believers in Philippi when we are actively preaching the gospel ourselves. And so I want to encourage you, would you do it? Would you share the gospel with somebody this week or come out with me? Okay, because we're going to do it together. I want to tell you, listen, God's still working. God is still moving. God saved people in Paul's day and he's still saving people today. But will you be obedient? Will you be available for God to use you? Think about it. Pray about it. Come on, family. Okay, this is perfect opportunity. And by the way, if you're here in Montgomery and you know, or you have a, a daughter or a son that goes to one of these high schools and you want me to on that campus, listen, I want to get on those campuses. I believe God's going to do a work. So get me on those campuses. You can hit me up, write me an email. You can send me a text. I'm telling you, I want to see God transform Montgomery, especially the young people. And so let's get on those campuses together. Okay, so that's the, the first thing that we see with Paul is he was thankful. He, he felt these feelings of love and affection because they were the first fruit. These were early believers with him for his ministry. The second thing that we see Paul's affections for is that they were growing in their relationship with Christ. So it was not just their salvation, but it was their sanctification. Number two. You see, not only did Paul get a chance to lead them to Jesus, but he got to the joy of seeing them grow up in Christ. These were baby Christians who were growing up strong. They were putting on muscle. They were standing bold for Christ, and that brought joy to Paul. You see, Paul visited Philippi for the very first time in Acts chapter 16, what I had you read. But he also visited them about five years later in Acts chapter 20. And so Paul got to go back and see these youngsters, to see these babies growing up in Christ. He leads them to the Lord, he leaves, and then he comes back and he's like, look at you guys, man, I'm so proud of you. You're growing and you're spreading the gospel and you're being used by God and Christ is being formed in you. And it brought him a lot of joy. That's why he wanted to go back and to be with them. And Paul gave them more encouragement. Now, 13 years later, he writes this book to them and he gives them encouragement to continue on. He's saying, look, I'm proud of you guys. You're doing the right thing. I remember back, but now he's like, look, I want you to continue more and more. Look at verse 9, 10, and 11. Paul is encouraging them in their sanctification. Verse 9, he says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more that you will keep growing in knowledge and understanding. Verse 10, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. There it is. From the first moment, he wants it to grow. It's like a little tiny fruit that's green, that's growing into maturity. It's taking on color now. He's saying, look, I want you guys to continue. You're doing great. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think that there's nothing happening. Continue. He says, you know, that you'd be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Verse 11, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. You see, he exhorted them to not just coast in their walk with Christ, but to really push down the gas pedal. I think, you know, in the South, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of Christians. There are. There are a lot of people that were basically born on the pew. They were go born going to church and they love church. They've got a church that their family belonged to and their, their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents are like, oh yeah, church, it's something we've done. It's very cultural. But what I've seen is that a lot of Christians here in the South, it's, it's like they've, they've let off the gas pedal and they're coasting. And sadly enough, many of them are almost to a complete stop where their relationship with God has become an almost a halt in place and they're becoming stagnant in their relationship with the Lord because it's almost non-existence. It's something that I did, but it's not something I do. Does that make sense? That's kind of what I'm seeing. Paul was telling these believers, I remember from the first moment and now I think about to the five-year mark, 
But you guys continue on. Listen, you got to continue to press on. I want you to, the phrase he uses, to grow more and more. And that's my desire for you, by the way, is that you would be growing more and more in your relationship with God. You should never be pleased with where you're at in Christ right now. You know, don't settle for your relationship with the Lord. Like, continue to press on, continue to lean forward, keep growing in your knowledge and your understanding of Jesus. You know, I have found that when I look in the rear view of my life, I can see that I, I definitely have grown. You know, I can look back and say, man, I'm, I'm not the old guy that I used to be. You know, I'm not where I should be yet, but I can definitely see God has been work in my life. Now, what I wanna show you is really the other flip side of this, because what I'm encouraging you to do is to lean in, press on, hit the gas pedal, pursue Jesus like nothing else. You know, make sure like in verse 10 that you live a blameless life up until the Lord's return, that you have this righteous character being formed in you. I want that, I want that, and you should want that. But also back in verse six, as I kind of opened up with, there's a little bit of encouragement here. Look at verse six. I don't want to fly over this. And it deals with sanctification. Verse six, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation, it says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You know, when I opened, I, I mentioned this, that you are a, a work that God started and you're still under construction. And, and that's kind of good news. And this is the reason why that's good news, why that's so like hopeful is because it's a quick reminder that, you know, God is the one that started the work in me and he's going to be the one that, that finishes it. Like I'm not all alone. Like this salvation is not dependent upon me, so to speak. Like I, it's not that in my failures, God turns his back on me and he throws in the towel with me. And I'm like, oh man, I got to pull, pull this thing back together again. And I got to get back on track. And, you know, and there's this crazy burden that you may be fooled into thinking that, that you're in control of your own salvation. It's like, no, no, no. God is the one who showed up in your life. God is the one who began that good work in you. And it's God is going to be the one that's going to continue it. You know, you're under God's craftsmanship. You're under his chiseling hammer. As I said, you're under his refining touch. Our getting to heaven safely does not depend on us. Our ability to hold on and persevere faithfully to the end of our lives. Like that's not necessarily what it's all about. It's like when I cross the street with my son, I've got a small three-year-old, and as we cross the street, you know, he has a tendency to hang onto my hand really, really tight in fear that I would let go or in fear that he would maybe get hit by a car or something bad would happen. But his grip on me is nothing compared to my grip on him. I'm hanging on to his hand much tighter than he's hanging on to mine. And it's the same thing in your relationship with God. Let me encourage you. You know, like you may be thinking, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. Your salvation is not dependent upon you. You've got a savior who is a greater savior than you are a sinner. He's the one that comes to the rescue. He's the one that's saving you like a drowning man, a lifeguard coming to the rescue. It's, it's the savior that pulls these sheep to safety. It's the savior that says, I'm not gonna lose you. I'm holding you in my hand and nobody can pluck you from my grip. Matter of fact, Jesus says this when he's in John chapter 17, he says, while I was with them, talking to God, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus reminds even his believers that day in John chapter 17 that, look, I, I've been with you. I've been protecting you. I've been holding you. I've got you. We're going to make it through and I'm not going to lose any of you. Now, why is this important for me and you? Like, why should we really take this to heart? Because some of you feel like that you've been going through dark seasons, difficult times. You feel distant from God, your emotions and your walk with God. It's not all sunshines and rainbows and roses. You know, it's, it's been difficult and you feel distant from God. Now, pause because there's maybe some of you are like, well, I don't, I've never experienced that. Just give it a little bit of time. You will experience this feeling, okay? But I want to tell you, if you're going through that right now, your emotions and your feelings, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. God is closer to you than you can even sense. I want you to look back in the rearview mirror of your life. Just look back to the beginning. Listen, you're not the same person that you used to be. 
You're not. Even if there's been even subtle changes, God is at work in your life. God has been at work in you from the beginning up until now. Now, this is a good way to understand it. My wife and I, we moved out here to Montgomery, Alabama, and we bought a really old house. We bought a house that's 121 years old. When we went into this thing, I mean, nothing had been painted. It was falling apart. There was no air conditioning and no heating. And, and so as we walked in, we started to realize that there was the evidences of generations of people living in this house. On the kitchen door, it was pretty cool. When I opened the kitchen door, there were all of these lines that were on the door. And as I looked at the lines, I started to see names by the lines. And I started to realize, wow, this is like a, uh, a little mile marker, if you will, for all of the different generations of kids that have been raised in this house. And so I was like, here's Susie, and you see age one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, like up to like age 27. And you see all of these across the entire kitchen door, you see all of these lines of kids. Now, as a child, you know, you think, man, am I growing? Like, am, am, I, am I progressing? And a child is unable to discern, you know, their growth patterns. And so you, you mark them on the door. And as you go back in time and you look at the marks on the door, you can see that there's growth taking place, that there's progress. And, and it's the same way in your Christian life. I think if we were able to go back even a year ago or two years ago or five years ago, if you've been older in the Lord, I promise you, even if you can't see it right now, there have been great changes that have taken place in your life that God has been doing, that God is gonna get credit for. Like, don't despair, don't, don't give up here. God is at work in your life. You are growing. As I open with in Romans chapter eight, where it says that he has predestined you to be conformed into the image of his son. God is molding you into the image of Christ. And so don't assume that you're the only one uh, that's at work here. God is at work in you. God is at work to both will and to do for his good pleasure is what it goes on saying even in, uh, in our text. And so you're, you're going the right direction. You're on the right track, but be of encourage because God is with you. You know, you may be holding on to God, but God is holding on to you. You are his possession. You are his work. And, and think about it this way. A sculptor is closest to his work when he's chiseling. Think about it like this. A farmer is closest to the vine when he's pruning. John 15, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. If you're feeling like things are being removed or life is not going as planned, it's kind of difficult and you feel distant, maybe the farmer is closer than you realize and maybe he's pruning, maybe he's molding, maybe he's shaping, maybe he's chiseling away. Maybe you're in the, the, the furnace that the Lord has and he's refining you as gold. Don't despair, God's eye is on you. He's controlling the situation, he's close at hand. He is going to finish the good work that he started. You see, it's been said that there's an old adage that hanging under every Christian's neck is the sign that says, under construction. It reminds me of Ruth Bell Graham. This is Billy Graham's wife on her tombstone. It says this, I'll show you a picture of her tombstone. It says, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. What a blessing. What a blessing. Paul was thankful for their sanctification. Lastly, we see in our text as we wrap it up, Paul was thankful for the Philippians' support. You see, the Philippian church was a very special church because they helped Paul in his ministry. You see, they came together and they helped support Paul and his mission, both with financial help and personnel help. So it was not only just money, but it was also people. You see, Paul called this fellowship in the gospel or partnership in the gospel. Look at verse five. Verse five, Paul kind of hints at it. He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The New Living Translation says, for you have been my partners. This is the Greek word koinonia, koinonion. And so we see Paul saying, look, you all have been fellowshipping with me in ministry, partnering with me, not only with what God did in you, but now for other people. And Paul was thankful for this. Not only did he see them come to faith, not only did he see them growing in their faith, but now he's seeing them care about other people's faith. He's like, man, you, you guys have come full circle. Where you have been brought to Christ, 
You've been growing in Christ. Now you want to see other people come to Christ. And Paul was thankful. Paul was grateful. Paul was rejoicing because these people really loved him and supported his ministry. It was financial assistance and personnel help. Now, Paul even says this explicitly later in the book. If you go to Philippians chapter 4, this is what it says, Paul speaking. He says it very clear. Starting in verse 15, he says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent money, aid, once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, verse 17, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Verse 18, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, so they also sent a friend to go to him, the things that you sent, and they are a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice that's well-pleasing to God. Paul was thankful to these believers because they supported his ministry. They realized that God had done a work in their life because of the ministry of Paul, and now they, they wanted other people to taste it. They wanted other people to experience it. And so they together said, you know what? Why don't we raise a little bit of money? Why don't we come together? Why don't we give and honor God with what he's entrusted to us by allowing Paul to not have to worry about money? You know, we can help pay some of his bills and feed him and provide for him, him and the crew as they go. So they can lean in more. They can take more ground. They can speak up louder. They don't have to waste their time, you know, with tent making and selling and hustling on the side. What if we what if we help in a very practical way? And that is what they did. And Paul was so grateful for it. And not only did they give financial help, but also they sent people to him. Epaphroditus came and helped him while he was in prison. You know, having this blessing of somebody coming, I mean, it's it's really an uh, a truth that's it's hard to describe. You know, see, why did this mean so much to Paul? And I think it's because of this, which me and Mary understand this, by the way, and I'll get to that. But I think when you walk by faith, you realize that it's a lonely road. The road that Paul chose to walk by faith, to be a light to the Gentiles, to be a witness to the Jews, to go into un, um, unmanned territory, places where the gospel had never been before, it's a lonely thing to do. It's a, it's a lonely task where you are walking by faith into the dark. You're walking into uncertainty. You're walking away from things that are comfortable. You know, Paul could have stayed where he was at and it would have been plush. It would have been good. But Paul was being obedient to the calling of God. And he's like, man, I'm going to go. And, and that's a difficult thing to do. It really is, you know, to walk by faith. Paul was being called by God. And so Paul was listening and he was following the voice. Paul went as a spokesman. He went as a church planter. He went as a trailblazer. And this church, they experienced the love of God through Paul, and they understood the impact that he had made, and they wanted to send him to go make more impact somewhere else. The church took up collections to send and cover and help with, you know, just practical things. And this financial assistance, it really helped them focus on preaching and winning people to the Lord. Now, as I said, This is a blessing, and me and Mary really understand this. I really get this. When I read this chapter, I go, man, I understand exactly what Paul is saying. You know, my wife and I, we we left Harvest, which was an amazing church. We were on staff. It was very comfortable. God was providing, and it was great. But then we, we heard the call from Alabama that we needed to walk by faith and go. And so we sold everything, and we walked by faith, and we drove across the nation. And here we are. We're in Montgomery, Alabama. Let me tell you, it's been a lonely road. It's been a place where we're stepping into the dark, into uncertainty. Uh, things are not just mapped out in front of us. It's not comfortable. There, there are daily times that I'm like, Lord, is this the right decision? God, what are we doing out here? And I'm thankful that God is with us, but it, it's a lonely place to be, you know? And, and so I, I read Paul's account and I go, you're right, Paul. What a blessing. Some of the things that my wife and I have been most thankful for has been the prayers of the saints. Many of you have written text messages and emails, and I just want to say thank you for all of your prayers. Thank you for thinking about us and caring about us, letting us know that you're praying for us. Paul had that comfort as well. But also, there have been many of you 
that have decided, you know what, I'm going to help support the ministry. And you've given to Jesus City. You've supported the work that God is doing. You didn't have to, but the Holy Spirit of God moved your heart. Maybe somehow, maybe the ministry at Harvest had an impact on you, or you just believe in the call on, on my wife and I. And, and you're like, you know what, I want to support the ministry. Let me tell you, it, it's amazing. It's a true blessing. When Paul thanks them from the bottom of his heart, so Mary and I thank you from the bottom of our heart. Like, thank you. Like, genuinely, like, may God multiply you a thousand times for, for blessing and coming alongside and saying, you know what, I want to invest in the work of the ministry. It, it really, just as it enabled Paul to run harder, speak louder, reach farther, um, it's actually been the same here where it, you've enabled us, you know, to reach farther, to speak louder, to, to continue on doing ministry. Paul thanked these people for their support in a very practical way. And I want to thank you for your support. Thank you. Genuinely, we love you. Your kindness, your generosity to the ministry, it's a blessing. And that we pray for you often that God would bless you. And I even want to say, listen, just as Epaphroditus came to Paul, maybe there's some of you that have been praying about Jesus City. Like, hey, God, are you calling me to Alabama? Listen, he is. <laughs> He's calling you. Come out and join me. You know, I mean, what else are you going to do with your life? You're going to stay a mechanic forever? You know, are you going to be a waitress, you know, forever? Are you going to be a server forever? Is that what you're doing? Is that the apex of the, the call of God on your life? It's like, why don't you move to Alabama? Why don't you help me take ground for the kingdom of God and see God do a revival here? Or maybe, maybe it's right where you're at. I just want to tell you this. Don't coast in your relationship with God. Listen to what God is guiding you to do. God will always call you to take steps of faith that are outside your comfort zone. My wife and I did it. Let me tell you, it's been different than we anticipated, but it's better than we could have ever imagined. And it'll be the same with you. This letter from Paul that we talked about today was simply a big thank you letter. It was a thank you to his beloved friends who supported him with people and finances. But Paul didn't just care about that. He cared about their soul. He not only cared about the gift, but he cared about the giver. And he said, look, I love you guys. I care about you guys. Continue to lean in, take ground. God started the good work in you and he's not gonna stop. God is gonna finish the good work that he started in you. And that's my encouragement to you today. Listen, God loves you. God started the good work in you. God's going to finish the good work in you. And just like it took all of those years to finish the White House and to finish the Great Wall of China and all of those other things, one day you're going to look into the eyes of Jesus and he's going to say, complete, finished, magnificent. He's going to finish his workmanship, his masterpiece. You are God's poem, it says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10. He created you and he's going to finish you. What great hope we have that the hand of God is upon our lives and he's molding us and shaping us in the image of Christ. And one day we will look just like him. God is going to finish the good work that he started. Right now you're under construction, but one day, like Ruth, Ruth Bell Graham's tombstone says, construction complete. Hey, what a wonderful time we had today in the book of Philippians. I hope you were encouraged. And we're going to continue through the book of Philippians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so stick with us uh, through our series called Joyful Living. These are the secrets to living joyfully. And this is one big secret we talked about today. You can live joyfully knowing that you're not all by yourself, that God is with you, and God is going to finish the good work that he started. Hey, I want to let you know we, we love you, and we're just so grateful for the work that God's been doing here. Uh, we've got some big things up and coming. If you're watching right now and you live local to Montgomery, we've got a men's prayer breakfast that's going to be going on. Uh, it's October 16th. It's going to be on a Saturday morning. You can find out more information if you go to JesusCityChurch.com to find out about our, our men's prayer breakfast. We also have our women's prayer breakfast that happens on the first Saturday of each month. The men's prayer breakfast is the third Saturday of each month. And we've got some big, exciting news that's going to be up and coming for the holidays, for Thanksgiving, and for Christmas, a Christmas party. But, hey, I love you. I, I'm excited to see what God's going to do in and through this city. Keep us in your prayers. And again, we thank you for all that you've done for Jesus City. God bless you, friends. There is a God in heaven who loves you. Don't you forget.